It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's our goal. Hey! It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey! hey. Everybody, welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. I'm Tom Papa. So good to be with you in this glorious, glorious new year. Everyone's filled with hope that we will pull out of all of the darkness and troubles and strife and get a vaccine put in our butts and we will all go on to better days. And I wish that, of course, for all of you. Thank you so much for being a part of our weekly feast, comedy and food feast. I really enjoy hosting and I enjoy that you come along. Make sure that you subscribe if you haven't subscribed, that really helps. And also give us little reviews, little stars wherever you can. Just put them in your notebook, put them online, put them on uh, iTunes, put them wherever, on the YouTube, wherever it is that you listen to us. Make sure that you uh, spread the word and uh, we'll keep growing and keep doing uh, great things. We have an amazing show for you today. We have Apollonia Poulan, who is a part of Bread Royalty. She is part of the Poulan Bakeries in Paris and London. She comes from great, great bread heritage. Her grandfather, Pierre, started the bakery in 1932 when he decided that he wanted to create these breads like he had when he was a child. The idea is these giant, big, round, miche breads. These giant, like, it's, you take one of my loaves that you see me post and double that. Uh, I'll also, I, I posted a picture of their breads already, and I'll, I'll do it again so you can see it. But the idea was, was to give people the ability to buy this one giant loaf of bread, and then they could live off of it for the whole week. And at first, uh, it was probably a little controversial. People didn't understand. It's all great things. Uh, usually, th th that's the story of a lot of great, innovative ways of putting things out into the world. And eventually, it catches on. And it's, uh, it's what she continues to do. Her father and mother took it over. And then she took over the bakery after they passed. And she's just a delight. She has a new master class. Uh, on bread baking. If you don't have Masterclass, this might be worth signing up just for this. She is, she takes you through all of their different styles of the way they make stuff in their bakeries. And then you get to learn. And I actually made one of the giant breads on my own following her recipe before we spoke on today's, uh, on today's interview. And it was good. It was weird making a giant bread. It was weird making something that is so massive, but it was great. And it did last for a good week, and we did eat all of it. And then just when I was done eating it, she was so sweet after our interview, and of course, we hit it off. She sent me a whole big gift basket box of Poulan pastries, cookies, breads, arrived literally on Christmas Eve. It was such a treat. We were getting ready for Christmas Eve, getting ready to do everything, and then these giant, beautiful baked goods come all the way from Paris. And that's what her father did, I believe, is that he moved some of the bakehouses close to the airport so they were able to export and spread their bread all around the world and it got to me in sunny California on Christmas Eve. She's a little Christmas elf is what Apollonia is. She's so great. I first became aware of her as I mentioned in the interview um, in Daniel Leader's book Living Bread which is this great book on bread baking and he would talk about all these different great bakeries and great bakers and Apollonia is was a part of it and I, I was really intrigued because they show her in her bakehouse it's like the same bakehouse it's you go down these little steps and there's this wood-fired oven and it would just seem so romantic and so great so that this podcast has led me to 
her directly and she sends me this bread and we're becoming friends and then we open up this whole nother relationship and I get to go to Paris one day and go and meet her and see these shops. That is uh, why we are doing this, right? That is what breaking bread is all about. You open up your hearts and your minds and you share some food and you make a good friend and if you hit it off, you hit it off and I think we hit it off and I will be going to Paris as soon as I get a vaccine in my butt. We also have a quick bite with our good friend Greg Grunberg, a very talented actor from Heroes and Star Wars and a whole ton of things. He was a guest on the show earlier in the season, one of our first guests, actually. He's so great and big and gregarious and fun and loves food, and I figured who better to have a quick bite with than Greg right after the new year and see how he fared, see how much weight he's gained, <laughs> how much joy he had, what did he eat, what went on in his life, in his house, with his friends and family during the holidays. And uh, we'll have a quick bite with him. Always great to check in. He's the best. Uh, what have I been doing? What have I been eating? Well, the last we spoke, we talked about, of course, the Feast of the Seven Fishes, which was very exciting. Then we rolled into New Year's, and it really becomes a bit of a slog towards the end of the holiday, doesn't it? When you're just staring at all of the gifts and all of the things that were given to you, we've gotten wine and bread and cookies and pastries and more bread and candies, and they're just all hanging around. And you could just keep eating them. You could keep eating every one of them for the end of time. But then you would end up with diabetes. <laughs> and you'd be five, you'd have to, you'd be poor because you'd have to go buy all new clothes. It's uh, at a certain point, you got to pull the ripcord. You got to, you got to call it quits and uh, just turn it down just a hair. And that's what I did over the last couple of days. I was like, all right, this, if the cookie starts, if you could start seeing the butter coming, oozing out of the cookie, it's just gotten to that stage. <laughs> it's time for it to go. And of course, you know, eat a little on your way to the garbage, as we always do. Um, but we got rid of a whole bunch of sugar, and that's okay. That's all right. They all did, ran, they all served their purpose, they brought a lot of joy. There's still a little around. There's still somebody delivered chocolates. There's still stuff if you want to break down and go. But at least that's the only way I cannot eat it, by the way, is if it's not in the house. And it's either eat it or throw it away or just, just it's got it can't be in the house or I'll think about it all day long and then I'll eat it. I'll find a way to cheat against myself and go and go grab another whatever. Uh, but yeah. I have friends that go completely dry in January. They don't drink and they don't eat sugar and they really detox. I'm not, I'm not, I, enough with the extremes. I can't go to that extreme. Will I cut back on the wine? Yeah, maybe a little bit. I don't know. I don't think red wine is a problem. Will I bang martinis out every night and end the night with a nice Lagavulin scotch by the Christmas tree? No, that's not happening every day. But it was fun to do it for two weeks straight. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think red wine continues to stay in the diet. I think just eating real foods, not eating a lot of uh, sugary manufactured processed stuff that just, there really becomes no thought when at that point. And I think that's the only thing that I'm going to do is dial back and think a little bit, be a little more thoughtful of what I'm putting in my face. I'm not going to stop putting stuff in my face. Last night I had elk from my good buddy Joe Rogan. I grilled that up outside. It was a cold night. Went outside, just got some steamed broccoli on the side of this beautiful elk. My dogs were both circling around me. Frank the pug is not allowed to eat it because he's on a uh, strict diet to clear up his bladder stones. Bella, on the other hand, knows that she doesn't have a problem, doesn't go to the vet, very healthy. Was like, we're not both on this diet. And she was right. So I snuck her a lot of elk on the side when Frank wasn't looking. It's very easy to fool Frank. He's uh, got big googly eyes and ends up staring off into space a lot. <laughs> not, the, not the brightest. Uh, I got a cool gift for uh, Christmas for my daughters. I got a mortar and pastel. The, um, you know, like the big clay 
pot, like a pharmacy thing with a pastel, 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 pastel. And uh, you mush the mortar into the pestle. Pestle? <laughs> I don't even know how you say it. Uh, the big mortar thing, you know, the big jug. The big, when you don't have, when you live in a time when there's no food processors and you mush it all in. And then just happened to look at food and wine last night before I was going to sleep, as one does when he's faced with nothing but bad news on his absence. They're like, well, let me just, food and wine won't keep me, give me a reason to stay up staring at the ceiling. And uh, there were all these recipes. It's how you make um, guacamole. That's a good, a good recipe that you can make for using this. Or you could uh, make a nice pesto, take the basil and your garlic and oil and just go to town and mush it all up in there. So I'm anxious to use that. And it's a big item, big heavy clay item that's out on the counter. So either you use it or you lose it. But uh, I'm excited for that. Going to turn down some of the big things when we spoke last. We were talking about make something big, go lasagna, go big, make something big and fun. Um, how about small and simple? Small and simple, but continuing to cook for sure because it's one of the only things really to do right now. So keep baking the bread, make yourself some kick-ass grilled cheese, make yourself uh, some great breakfast sandwiches. That I gave bread to my pals Gil and Risa, and they have dialed in the breakfast sandwich with my bread. Ooh, they've got it down. The right amount of cheese, the right amount of egg, little baby arugula. Oh, they uh, they make it and then send me pictures like, why aren't you doing this with your own bread? <laughs> but I am. I am. There's a lot more toasts also to get in, into. I also saw this recipe for, um, it was, what was it? Oh, it was pecorino cheese and mint, and uh, a fava beans, which really doesn't really play because spring is really when those fresh ones come out. But uh, but yeah, there's so many different elements. I think that is where I'm going to put a lot of my focus. I always have the bread. It's always around, you know, avocado toast, ricotta and radish, different things like that, sardines, all those different combinations to have something really good and basic and then have a bowl of it. And then you're, for your kids, just roll in, take the bread, put it in the toaster, mm, pop that up, and they already have the thing. They just have to spread it and eat it, and it's healthy and good for you and delicious. That's what we should be doing. That's how I should be living. Uh, when I eat the elk, I, I eat alone. When I uh, make the toast, everybody eats. Um, all right, well, what do you say we jump right into it? Because this is a good... It's not a uh, it, it's not a gigantic interview. We don't go forever, but it's nice and it's a good serving. I'll say that it's a nice, good serving. You're going to love her. She's such a great voice, so good to talk to. You learn a lot. Again, go to go to master class and look up her bread baking uh, class, and you also get this downloadable book with it. It's really pretty great. And then we will have a quick bite with our good friend Greg Grunberg. Enjoy. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Thanks for doing this. This is very exciting for me. I am very excited to be with you tonight, Tom. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Tom. Um, I've been baking bread for, I guess, about, about six years or so that I started uh, discovering it and getting, having my life uh, be overtaken by the <laughs> craft of baking bread. Uh, so I was very aware of you. And then before your master class came out, which is amazing, by the way, we'll get into that as well. I first uh, saw a picture of you in Daniel Leader's book, Living Bread. Mm -hmm. And, and then you thought, I need to build that 100-ton oven and <laughs> bake breads in my backyard, right? Oh, my God. I know. Yes, that is 100% true. I, I, whenever, I see, whenever I see somebody with an amazing oven, I just, oh, I cry. Uh, but there's this, <laughs> there's this beautiful shot of you looking in the oven with the peel. And, yeah. and since I read that book and... And saw you I've been thinking about you and the biggest thing I think about is that you they mention in it that you eat a, a you eat sourdough toast every morning with your team 
I do. And this was pre-COVID, though. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you could be with so, the team. <laughs> exactly. So every so at the bakery, we have this tradition of having breakfast amongst the teams just after we've opened the store, uh, and the first orders are fulfilled. We sit down and we share coffee, tea, experiences, laughters, um, and fun moments. Um, and we toast bread. Um, we've been toasting bread um, together for the past 18 years. It's amazing. So this is, there's some, a lot of times when I come in now, and I'll come into before I go on and do my radio show, it's very early in the morning, and I think, well, Apollonia is doing it, so I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> 100%. And it's just not, it's not just me. It's me, the teams across the stores. So we're with you, Tom. <laughs> and I found in Los Angeles, I found this little shop, this little cook shop that has this imported French butter, which I should have brought out so I could have the name of it. That was that changed everything too. having this butter that comes directly from France with that bread. Oh my God, it's, what a nice way to start the day. Now, but you've been doing this since you were a child because you're third generation in this bakery. Third generation. My grandfather studied Poilin in 1932. We're on the left bank of Paris in the heart of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. And we, my, and he started baking this traditional French sourdough bread, these big hugs of bread that would feed your day, not only because people ate more bread, but also because they couldn't afford to waste it. So having a big bread made for a loaf that would keep longer and, and you know, work on methods that would bake a bread that sustains a worker's day. Um, my father took over in the 70s, structured the family business, and I took over in the fall of 2002 barely 18, um, on a year off before I went to college, my parents unfortunately passed away in an accident. Right. And I was pushed at the head of the family business a little sooner than planned. Yeah. Now, were you, did you have in your mind you were young, but at, at that time, were you thinking you would go into the family business? Or, Absolutely. Or, so that was always, no, no, a, yes. that was always the plan. That was, that was not only was that always the plan, but I was taking a year off before I went to college. So what happened was I was uh, working in the bakehouse in the mornings and literally from one day to the next, instead of going down to the bakehouse, I went up to my father's office. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's that. I, I've read that story where you sat at the desk after this tragedy and you're like, well, now I have to go to work. This is this is just the way that life is unfolded and and you've done a, an amazing amazing job with it but you went to harvard when right before like well so actually i went afterwards so when um so i took over the family business over my year off in the fall of um 2002 and i had been admitted at harvard so i had basically 10 months ahead of me to decide what i was going to do of my um, college admission right. and Harvard being Harvard. I was like, Oh, well, let's try. <laughs> <laughs> and, and four years later, I graduated with a degree in economics. Um, and I feel incredibly blessed by yeah. my friends, my colleagues that all supported me in that journey. Um, and just being young that, even if you have a few hours less sleep, you can absolutely survive it. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's amazing. I have a, a daughter that's in college now, and it's I'm the the thing I'm so envious of is just the energy, just the. Th oh my god, <laughs> yes, and the student body, and being confronted to ideas, to to people who are passionate about things you wouldn't even dream existed yeah and i think that was something that really echoed the way i grew up where i in my family's um well with my sister our parents really pushed us to be open-minded and 
hungry for new experiences, for learning new things. Yeah. And I think that helped me develop my understanding of my craft at that intersection between cereal grains, grains and fermentation. And in um, whether during the apprenticeship system where we really emphasize the five senses um, or my most recent book where um, we where I offer methodologies of how to bake bread um, in a way that echoes the way I work at the bakery or in the masterclass where I explain how to bake bread at home, I really try to give my um, readers, my viewers, the feeling, the sensations, the, the sense of touch, taste, smell, the sounds as well of bread baking. And all of these things make for that complete experience, that sensorial experience of baking bread. You really, you really do capture it because look, I have been, I have a stack of books over there of baking bread. I have them in my kitchen. I have, I, I, I'm in it. I've been, I've been digesting this stuff for a long time now. And yours is exceptional. It really, to take a subject that I've been really into and digesting and then to have a, a new appreciation for it uh, that you've opened up in both of these. I mean, the book is great and the, the hearing you hearing you in the master class is such a is such a treat. It's such it to, the, the five senses thing aspect of it really resonated with me because it's it is an immersive craft. It is something that you are as you move along how it feels to you or the timing of it, the intuition of it, all of those things, I felt like I was just kind of, it was happening to me as I was learning, but I thought it was just me that was experiencing it. And then to hear you with even all more experience kind of actually explain what Validating I was Validating your, yes, yeah. Yes, it yeah. Was, you did and a you great know, job. The good news is that, well, first of all, thank you for the compliments because what you're saying means that I've done a few things right to really convey how things actually happen at the bakery. We train our bakers for nine months to learn how to bake our batches of 50, 100 loaves. Right. And they, the apprenticeship is all about attuning your five senses, getting to learn how to greet the different seasons and different um, a weather conditions and learning how to adapt and learning how to build that mental library of experiences and situation meets gesture meets consequence. Right. I love the, yes, gesture. I love that term gesture. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard people use that in, in any of the baking. I, I really like that because it is, it is this, it becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of, of, your identity and what you're pouring into it it's it's you my wife likes to bake and is is into baking like in precision like cakes and pastry like that kind of thing which i was never really into i was more into cooking but bread seems like it's kind of the in-between where yes it is 100%. measured right but don't you feel like it's a little more artistic you you have more it's, play absolutely and I think I think and, and you, you you nail it. It's it's exactly that. It's that balance between on the one hand a very artistic craft and on the other hand a sense of precision because you just can't um and it's that dialogue that makes for the perfect loaf. But yeah. but it is it is a balance and and by nature it is thus imperfect and you needs to be fed and nurtured. Yeah. Uh so I baked your wheat loaf last night. Okay. Sweet. Good job. Not bad, right? I tried to get your P in the scoring. I don't, it's kind of close. It's, <laughs> you, did, you did pretty well. Good, good for you. Pretty good. Uh, now this, I have to How say- How did you do I, on the knock test? <laughs> it's good. It's got a good little knock. We're pretty good, right? I'll come in. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, when I I use the same amount of flour. Now I followed your 
master class and then also the great part about getting the master class is it also has the cookbook download to it as well so you can kind of yes. slow it down you can get the feel from you about how to do it but then you can actually sit and have the measurements out and all the rest of it but this is uh the same amount of flour that i put into two loaves when i'm baking on my own <laughs> really <laughs> yeah <laughs> This is a lot. This is a giant loaf. My my kids walked in this morning and said, this is the biggest bread you've ever made. You know, like, so about a, in the 1900s, an average French person ate about 900 grams of bread per day. Wow. And they made such big loaves, not only because you needed to feed yourself, and that was probably the, your main source of nutrition sure. but it also because when you have such a big volume then you can keep the bread longer because it just has more surface for the air to make its way through to dry it out wow. um, so there is you know the volume and 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 the density and all of those factors are also important in the taste and in the keeping of the loaf thereafter now here's my question though when I was shaping it, uh, I had put it in the bowl and, and let it rise. And then when I was shaping it to go into the basket, it was already a pretty massive size. It was yeah. pretty. It was pretty large. And you said in the in the in the instructions like it should be about an inch or so below the rim of the basket. But I actually yeah. I don't know if I screwed up. But I started out. It was kind of filling the was basket already. already. All right. Well, if that's the case, then just try a bigger basket uh, so that you can. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, the one thing you don't want is for it to go overflow, right? Right. It um, wasn't that it was overproofing. No, no, no. I, I entirely trust you. Um, I, I really <laughs> think so. So I when when I tested um recipes um of course i have all the material i have in the bacon i thought okay that's great um right. i have i have the professional's experience what <laughs> would i do if i don't have any of this material so i started right. using a, just a simple kitchen colander and then you can of course you know there's different comes in different sizes and shapes so you're looking for a mesh one that will not be too too small so that it can fit loaves and avoid having the issue you ran into um so i'm, I'm only half joking when i say get get a bigger <laughs> basket <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> and yeah. and and if you don't then then just you know just let it rise on either in a bigger bowl or or um um or just on your in in a, a linen or cotton weave woven cloth right yeah i just kept an eye on it and i just rather than let it go for another two hours i put it yeah. in a, a little over an hour and it it okay. worked out it worked out fine but it was so it was really like oh this is the this is because your bread is legendary and it is legendary for being that size so to have like this bigger even uh ken forkish who has uh who has this great bakery in portland and he has fame here in the US, he even mentions your bread as being these bigger loaves. So it was very exciting, I have to say, when I pulled this thing out last night, it was like, oh, wow, it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and what's great is that you clearly have the baking experience that you're not afraid of just saying, oh, I'll adapt because I know how to do it. Um, or I'm not, and I'm not afraid of trying. And I think that's another lesson about baking is it's a sensorial experience that you must go through and test and try over and over and trust that in the process you're learning more than what the frustration of a, a less perfect loaf comes out right. um, on a given day. Yeah. Now you have to. Uh, it's 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 really what what's kind of scary is when you learn something and you get good at it like i'm good at making certain types of breads and then if you branch out and go into something new it's very humbling because and then you're, you're like, starting all over <laughs> again right yeah it's like learning anything new in life it's like you gotta kind of 
you you go back to being a five year old child of like not wanting to make mistakes or be embarrassed. Yes. <laughs> You know, that echoes so much. When I started working on my cornbread, 100% corn flour, I really felt like I was just starting from scratch all over again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and testing and trying, tasting, yeah. um, until I finally got to that right balance. Um, uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was... It's quite. Yeah. It, it's it's a great experience, and 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 you're right. Uh, bread baking is humbling because at the end of the day, it is what the dough, what before that the grain has to say. Yeah, and it's different depending on the time of the year, the season, the weather conditions. Right. Uh, your voice is so great, by the way. You should have a master class. You should do more. It's just so nice listening to you. I have to say. Uh, Thank when, you, Tom. Tell me about, tell me if we can, if we can nerd out a little bit, because this is talk about being humbled. Um, talk to me about the use of rye flour, because that, I, I just started playing around with rye, and that's a whole different creature. So let me, let me set, set the, the stage here. I view my craft as the crossroads, the encounter or even maybe the metamorphosis of grains through fermentation mm -hmm. to bake. And so the consequence of that is I'd love in the years to come for, for bakers, um, whether professional or home bakers, um, or in the general language to stop using the word flour to generically mean whether it's wheat flour or whatnot, but just to not to mention what is the grain you're working with. Okay. And that realization is what helped me really shift my view and understanding of my craft as, as that metamorphosis, grains and fermentation. And so at Poilan, we've been baking using wheat flour and rye flour for historical reasons. These are two grains that you find in France quite widely. Mm -hmm. uh, wheat has more gluten than rye, and rye is traditionally found in poorer, in regions where the soil is, is, is poorer um, it, or harsher. It's not a grain that's very highly regarded because it's very thick sticky, heavy. Yeah. Um, it's one that people enjoy, especially in the winter with um, um, seafood, uh, associate with fish. But having a mother that was born in Eastern Europe, I actually realized that I love rye flour. I love rye flour because for me, it's got some, some smells some flowery, I mean, sorry, floral um, uh, uh, scents, and it's got a chew that is very different and one that I really appreciate. Yeah. It is, in some ways, it can help. It's working breads with rye flour um, can be harder at some stages of baking um, or easier. Um, I think broadly speaking, it's not necessarily the easiest grain to work with because it doesn't have as much rise because it has less gluten than right. wheat flour. But I think that it is, it's worth, it's worth the trip because the sense, the flavors and, and, the, and, you know, and the learning experience of how, that grain reacts and how that flower is yeah is something that's beautiful it's uh my grandfather was my one grandfather was from germany and so he mm -hmm. they always had a little more of the darker breads and the rise yeah they're like the pumpernickels yeah. exactly yeah and when and i started playing with it i was like the same thing that you're saying like that sensation was like oh this is familiar in some way and I tried using, um, I think, too much rye, so it became very unmanageable. It was hard to shape and, and deal with. So then I just started playing around with cutting it back a little bit and putting it in the mixture with these other grains. Yeah. And, uh, oh, but man, there's something so satisfying about that, about that grain. Yeah, yeah. And especially, like, so 
it, um, over the years, I have developed um, a collection of cookies at the bakery. They're sable, so they're this Normandy sandy textured cookie that um, has um, where each cookie has a different grain. Yeah. And in my journeys, uh, and, and this stems from testing and trying with different grains and getting to see the very unique flavors which each one boosts, the unique qualities that each one has. And, and, it's, and it's what it, what it is about rye is, I mean, it's, it's really an incredible grain, uh, whether it's in sweets or savory confections, it's, it's one that I have a sweet spot for, yeah. not only for, um, because it's one that I'm familiar with, but also one because that intrinsically has just an awesome taste. Yeah. Oh man, I, I'm excited because deep in that's your next the next recipe in your book is the rye. So I'm like, oh, now I get to go do that one. This is going to be <laughs> such a treat. <laughs> how um how are things going? How are things going for you now during this shift with how, with the bakeries and uh, you're dealing with the same struggles that we are here in the states. Um, are you guys faring okay? Are your workers okay? The, um, we are incredibly fortunate at the bakery, whether in Paris or London, that we are able to stay open as essential businesses. Mm -hmm. We try and really focus on nurturing whatever we can do for the community, starting with the teams. Right. Um, and, and whether it's France or the UK, both countries have undergone lockdowns. Uh, um, and so we've been able to, to operate, um, but we also have an appreciation of uh, the importance of, of being attentive um, to our gestures and responsibility to some extent of feeding the community. Yeah. Um, so whether it's bread, cookies, or baker's pastries, uh, I think that I have a sense of pride, but, um, but also my teams um, have um, that that task and pride themselves of baking bread that feeds the community of Parisians, of Londoners, of French people and worldwide, we ship worldwide from, uh, uh, if, you, if you go on our website. Um, so it's, it really is uh, both something that's very unique and very fulfilling but something that is also that beautiful connection. Yeah, and it's amazing that you're able to to have that reach and become really a large company, but have that that heart still attached to it. That's that's not uh, that's not an easy task, and I think it it really is a um, uh, it's attributed to you because you're the heart and soul of it, and if. if it's very easy for people to kind of sell out and move along and not be that attentive to the craft and to what they're doing. But you can tell that from what you're doing that it permeates through the whole com the whole company. And these people have got to be very grateful that they're able to still get this product, especially now that familiar that they can still go. They they end up relying on you, which I, I hate to put all this responsibility on you, but <laughs> it's it really is meaningful to people to be able to go in and get the thing that they get all the time, especially when their lives are a little more stressful. Yeah, and it's you know, it, and it's the bread itself because it's these big hugs of bread that keep that will feed you, that um, nurture your body and soul, uh, and it's the heritage of an 88 year old sourdough started by my um, by my um, grandfather in 1932 right. in the heart of Paris. It's how my father um, confronted with the classic, I'm growing and need to develop my business dilemma of quantity over quality and him choosing quality. Right. But his response um, was not only about um, 
saying it, it was also realizing that his craft allowed for an, a very unique approach where each bakery or each bakehouse has one baker that works on their um, batch from start to finish. And that makes um, not only for quality control, but also for the scaling of our um, baking or production right. of breads by having 24 ovens, one next to the other at our manufacture right outside of Paris. Wow. And because, because he, he had to think about that, my father also thought about the way he was teaching our bakers how to bake breads and therefore how to, um, um, how to develop that, um, um, that into our own unique apprenticeship um, system. Right. And that explains where we are at today and how we are able to bake loaves, but yet never compromise on quality because behind every loaf you have in your hands, there's one baker that hand shaped it and that drew a P, which uh, is ultimately their signature and their handwriting. Beautiful. Well, I'm going to work really hard on trying to perfect the P because my name is Papa, so the P is appropriate. You need 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as soon as this is all over and I can take my passport out of my, out of my closet, I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to come and, and uh, give you a hug and a big thank you because it's been uh, a real pleasure that you're doing this and that you continue to do what you do in your master class and the book. It's all so exciting that I just, uh, I, I can't wait to meet you in person someday. Well, we can't wait to meet you too and share bread, share a tartine, slather it with butter, um, go and visit the bakehouse. We, that would be beautiful. Uh, um, I, I can't wait for the world to, to open up again um, uh, and, and share more bread. It'll be great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Have a you, great Tom. holiday season. Likewise. Best wishes for the holidays to you and to everybody listening. All right. Take care. Bye. We'd like to thank our sponsor for today's show, BetterHelp. BetterHelp.com. A great, great service. A good way to improve your mental health. We all go through stuff. We've all, especially this year, have dealt with a ton of anxiety. Everybody's got something they gotta deal with. And it's nice to have somebody outside of your normal circle that you can talk to and express your feelings with and let it all out and also get some advice. It's just, I think uh, in the old days they would tell you, suck it up. <laughs> They would tell you, be quiet and suck it up. And we learned that that doesn't really help people out all that much. What actually helps is contact with another human being. And it sometimes can be intimidating to make that step and ask for help and find it and make the appointment and get the referral. And are you going to be able to trust them? Better help is the way to go. They give you licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, if you had any trauma that you've had to deal with. Anything you share is confidential. It's convenient, it's professional, and it's affordable. You can check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. It's not a crisis line. It's just a place where you can hear uh, other people and how they were able to get help and also find your way to getting some help from our good friends at BetterHelp. They are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So if you want to start living a happier life today, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash papa. That's P-A-P-A. -A. Our good people at BetterHelp. BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash papa good way to put yourself in a good state of mind start the year off right find yourself uh uh through the, all of the weeds and look sometimes it doesn't have to be a crisis sometimes it's just nice to have somebody that you can rely on i mean in my comedy world everybody i know is uh talking with a therapist and working things out and 
the stigma is long, long gone. This is just, if you're going to work out and try and improve your health, uh, this is another way to do that. Just take care of yourself. And, uh, you know, we've got a little ways to go before we're completely out of the woods and back to our life. So if you need help now, it is totally understandable. And look, we always need a little massaging and a little help along the way to live a better life. Once again, our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash papa, P-A-P-A, and I almost didn't spell my name right, and you'll get 10% off your first month. Thank you, BetterHelp. Okay, what do you say we take a quick bite right now with our good friend Greg Grunberg? Let's see what he's been eating. Let's see how he's been living. He's a great guy. We were doing these great shows in uh, L.A. together at the Woodshed where we were able to come in and bring a tiny audience, but it was really fun. And we were like, oh, this is the way we're going to come back. This is how we're going to bring back live, live comedy to Los Angeles. And then, of course, Los Angeles got even worse. <laughs> so they've been put on hold a little bit, which is a bummer for a lot of reasons, but mostly just because I don't get to see Greg's uh, lovable face. So let's, uh, let's give a quick call on the phone and get uh, our good pal Greg Grunberg on the line. Greg! Yes. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Uh, you know, hanging in there. Good. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't believe it. I was just saying to uh, to my wife last night, she's like, what happened to the woodshed shows? I'm like, we, we can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we, we're afraid of even being with five people at this point. Yeah. We just did a New Year's show. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I hosted it and it was these mixologists that, um, you know, they, you buy a drink kit for 150 bucks and you get all the alcohol and everything and all the ingredients. And they hired a DJ and they hired, uh, all these cabaret singers and then they hired me to host it. And I was like, okay. And we shot it at the building and Brad had these cabaret singers come in one at a time in front of a green screen. And even that, I was like, I don't want to go in for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even want to, no way. <laughs> I mean, oh. so then New Year's, New Year's, I went in on New Year's at nine o'clock and I sat at a table and they had these cameras already set up, no one behind them. And yeah. they had like three or four people in the control room and I didn't feel comfortable. I was like, you know what, Brad, I'm going to do the beginning here and the rest I'll do from home. It's a Zoom thing anyway. Why do I, why do I, right. I have to do this? yeah. You know. Oh, it's so crazy. Well, we'll get back. We'll get back. Yeah. I know. We're clever. So how did you do? How were your holidays? Isn't it funny how you actually you know without traveling without doing too much production work uh it still felt like a break where you could just sit around and eat and drink yeah absolutely um <laughs> and my son came back from you know college um at lmu you know which is right by real close but still he came out yeah and he has fa he fancies himself a chef so Ooh. we're like challenging each other and and the the smoker got so much use i will tell you <laughs> it was incredible <laughs> what was your best one um well i do a i do like a 17 hour brisket oh my god which, yeah but that's where you go to sleep and you have nightmares that your house is going to burn down because you're literally smoking meat <laughs> through the night i mean when can you possibly where could you possibly adjust it where you go all right, I'm going to put this in the smoker, and 17 <laughs> hours later, it's going to be dinner time. Like, that doesn't happen. <laughs> How big a piece of meat? Um, it's a nice size. I mean, we have this market out by us, and it's, it's like a small local market. So I went in, and I'm like, all right, I got the boys. And the thing is, he went, you know it's a problem when they don't go into the case, and they go back into the back fridge <laughs> to get your meat. <laughs> put it over the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. And you hear... Like, you hear what sounds like rustling cattle, and you're like, wow, this is, this is a big piece of fucking meat this guy's getting from me. Oh, my God. Did you nail it? Was it after 17 hours? Was it uh, perfect? Falling apart. Really? Yeah, it's, oh almost like, it, it's almost like chipped beef at that point because yeah. it just falls apart, and the juices, and the last four hours, I wrap it. So. Uh -huh all the juice it kind of steams in its own juice and it's oh, oh my god and is there a side a is there a barbecue pork, sauce pork, on the pork. side um we have yeah we got some barbecue sauce and then yeah yeah we have a, a lot of sauce from it to, uh -huh. to, to have on the side we do brisket sandwiches and oh, um oh, it's just it's incredible it's like 
You know, oh my God. Yeah. So what about sweets? Do you go sweets during the holidays um, or was it mostly just big man meat? No, it's big man meat, but I got to count it <laughs> the sweets. And the sweets this year, I almost sent you something. I, I, are you familiar with, um, uh, I think we talked about it. Um, what's it called? That, that app where you can get the best food from anywhere around the country. Oh, uh, yeah, Gold yeah. Belly. Right, Gold Belly. right. Oh, no, what did you do? Well, so here's the thing. It's like a challenge. <laughs> right. So, you know, I find something, I send it to you. I'm going to do this, actually. I'll send you <laughs> what, and I'll tell you right now what it is. So I, I love a good carrot cake. Love Me too. a good carrot cake. That's and, my fave. Oh, my God. Well, the best carrot cake in the world is this place called Lloyd's in New York. And uh-huh. little place in Brooklyn. And it's been covered on the news. As this guy, apparently, um, he and his buddy, his buddies used to come over years and years and years ago. And, yeah. uh, and he would make them carrot cake. And they just said, <laughs> this is the greatest thing ever. He has since passed away, but his wife is carrying on the recipe. They have a little shop. Whoa. They are exploding, exploding on gold. I send it to JJ, my buddy. He sent it to – this other guy I'm doing a documentary with. I sent it to Glenn. Glenn then sent it to another – it's like this thing where it's oh the challenge. Oh, my God. Of, like, what's the <laughs> yeah. I'm going to send you one. And oh, my God. You're going to – it's the greatest <laughs> carrot cake ever. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Oh, I can't oh wait. God. All right, so last question. What, um, how much weight do you think you gained between Thanksgiving and the New Year? Well, as soon as this thing hit, I, I put on the COVID-19. I think that's right. why they call it COVID-19. <laughs> because I, I, I put on – and I've been biking, so I've uh-huh. definitely been balancing it out. I think I oh, lost good. about 20. Oh, nice. During the holidays, I think I've put on probably another 10 pounds of just, yeah. you know – Sheer yeah. um, uh, joy. Yeah. <laughs> sure joy, right? All, all <laughs> happiness <laughs> and good things. <laughs> but, right. Oh, that's so, amazing. So, all right. Well, I can't wait to. Uh, I'll, I'll call you offline. We'll we'll catch up and plot our our return back to uh, to the world when LA gets under control. But it was so great talking to you. You too. Um, and uh, I need your address offline. Uh, I think I have it, but confirm it with me because I'm sending you a carrot cake. <laughs> Just what you need during the January resolution month. <laughs> exactly. I'll that's send my, it immediately. That's my New Year's resolution is to get my 10 pounds off of me and off to you. I knew who I was calling. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, buddy. I'll All talk right, to you soon. Bye. Okay. Okay, everybody, that's it for the big show. We want to thank our good friend Greg Grunberg and, of course, Apollonia Pilon. Uh, I hope you guys all had a good time. Take care of yourself. Make something good. Listen to something funny. And enjoy your life. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.